Okay, so what we have had so far, we have the uh, last few weeks, we had Stephen, Stephen the, uh, the deacon, who uh, was arrested, tried, actually not even tried, he was brought before the Sanhedrin, and he had a chance to give his message, it was an amazing message, the whole chapter 7 of Book of Acts, and then at the end, he was accused of blasphemy, and he was killed. And we saw Philip, another deacon, that was used by God in different ways. One, to preach in Samaria to large numbers, see large crowds come to the Lord. And then God just moved him by the Spirit, had him serve one person. As an example that both are important, whether you serve, you minister, you preach the gospel, you, you are the gospel to one person, it's equally important the Spirit of God as if you preach to multitudes. And we saw the importance of Philip's ministry last, I think it was last week. I, I lost track right now, but I think it was last week. Anyway, so today we actually move for the, uh, to the chapter 9 and just the first nine verses. And we look at the conversion of Paul. He's still Saul. He's known as Saul now. He's, he's going to become Paul, I think, in chapter 13. But for now, he's Saul. And why is this important? Because this man, unlike probably any other human, living, uh, human person except Jesus Christ, who is both human and God, he had the greatest impact on the church of Christ, both through his preaching, through his missionary work, and through his writing, his theological writing. He left an indelible mark in the church history, and his transformation is so important. We're going to give actually uh, to Paul two weeks, uh, this one and next one, to watch, to look at both lessons from both his conversion and the next few years after he was converted, converted and see what we can learn from that. The zeal of Paul, the right of the theology, the discipling and the mentoring and the missions, this will fill probably Acts 13 through the end of the book. So we'll hear this name a lot. And we want to put some foundation to uh, how, did he, how did he become from Saul, the persecutor, Paul, the Apostle. We we'll start today and it's going to be a long journey with Paul for over the next few few months. So who was Saul and his life before this road or this trip, this journey to Damascus? We know of him to be a Hebrew, a Jew, trained in the best rabbinic schools. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a very influential uh, a Pharisee. He was also a Roman citizen. We'll learn this in the next few chapters where he brings it up as, an, as a trump in his, uh, in his pocket. He was very well versed both in the Greek language and Latin language and in the cultures of the Greek empire, former actually, in the Roman currently empire, as well of course in the Jewish thinking. He was a man that was in tune with his times. You know, he was exposed to all this teaching. He came from the city of Tars, or actually it's Tarsus in English. Uh, and the city of Tars had the second best uh, university, education-wise, in, in the area of, of, of the Mediterranean. I think Alexandria had the, the greatest, and Tarsus actually had one of the, I think the second or the third, maybe the third. It was up there in the top three. Uh, you know, the Ivy League of the Mediterranean uh, theological schools was in, Thar in Tarsus. So Paul had all this best education, culture, influences to make him a very versed thinker in the in the age in that age and we know he was a pharisee he was a pharisee intent on destroying this new cult that was budding after the death of that one carpenter named jesus he like um, uh, gary just read let me actually open up there he was breathing fire or breathing breathing something he was still bringing threats and murder against the disciples this was Paul the Pharisee, so committed to extinguish any root of rebellion against, as we thought, against God. He thought these were rebels. He didn't know that he was actually the rebel. And God is about to capture this rebel's heart. St. Augustine had this phrase he coined in a book about Paul. He said, the violent capture of a rebel's will. That's how uh, uh, St. Augustine described uh, the book of, uh, chapter 9 of the book of, uh, of Acts, the violent capture of a rebel's will. I kind of used that a bit today in the end at least, but anyway, let's hear um, about uh, Paul's own credentials. He says in Galatians uh, 1, 
For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. Hear these words. He knows he tried to destroy the church. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Or Philippians 3. He says about himself, I was circumcised in the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and to the, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which the, is in the law, found blameless. As a Pharisee, he lived a life that by their rules could make, him, could make himself be called blameless before the law in his zeal. Or as uh, Gary just read, I'm going to just go briefly about this because we've just read. Now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked for letters for him to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was on a mission to, to Damascus to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem to be judged, to be tried. They most likely found guilty of uh, blasphemy and therefore put to death so he was a wild opponent of the way and the way is a, uh, an interesting way to refer to the christian walk to to uh, to the church you know the christians use this phrase we are on the way why would be that remember john i am The way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, Jesus said. And they followed, they used this phrase, we are on the way. So it was we haven't used that much lately, but in the beginning, that was an interesting way to address the church. So Paul's, sorry, Saul, his heart was filled with hatred. His mind filled with prejudice against the church and against Christians. In a way, it's kind of like the perfect storm, the perfect opportunity for God to work his way into this situation because God is a master of changing hearts and God can do the impossible. It reminds, reminds me of, of a passage, I think a few passages in Genesis, when God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob promises as patriarchs that through them and through them, through them bodily, a nation would come, a great nation would come. And what do we know? Abraham is old. His wife is even, no, his wife is also old, not even older. His wife is also old and she was barren. And then we hear about Rebecca, that she was also barren. And we hear about Rachel. I'm sorry, Leah, Rachel or Rachel? Or both. <laughs> that were barren, you know? So God has a way to, to work out in this impossible situation to show us who is in control. And just like with Paul, you know, who could, or Saul in this case, who, who would have thought in those days that that man, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Jew of the Jews, a persecutor of the church, a man of the law, and I'm talking about the law of, of, of Moses, would become the greatest champion of the church. You know, it's amazing transformation. And that is, you know, two words here, grace and mercy. Two words can describe Paul's transformation grace and mercy undeserved grace god did not choose him because he was well trained or well versed god chose him because god had mercy on on saul reminds me you know i i spoke i was 2018 i had a phone conversation with my college from for my colleagues from high school and uh, i haven't seen someone i haven't talked to them in in 30 years and we had a 30-year reunion and i was only on the phone call because i was in canada and one of them, a, a doctor, she could not believe that I was a pastor. She thought I was lying. She honestly thought I was lying. And uh, why? Because Adi from 1988 was the farthest thing you could think of a Christian, Bible-preaching, God-loving pastor. You know, I was shy. I could not even stand talk, you know, talk to more than two people. If I would see a beautiful girl in front of me, I would like, you know, froze, freeze. I, I, you know, I was not a man of the book. I wouldn't, I, I was not, I was a reader, but I was like, anyway. So I was not the persecutor of the church, but I was definitely an atheist. I believed in UFOs and, you know, read science fictions and stuff like that. So 
I was a pure product of the uh, communist youth organization. I was actually a secretary of our local organization in high school for, for a while. So I was just a typical kid from a communist nation back in 88. Look at my, where am I today? It'll be seven years in a few, months, a few weeks when I've, been, I've landed in Canada and I'm a pastor of a beautiful church like ours. God's grace and mercy. Nothing is deserved. Everything is because of God's grace. So this grace would lead to a miraculous transformation of a man's heart and mind. So what happened here on this Damascus road? As I just heard Gary read, an encounter with the living Christ. He's on the way to Damascus, which is actually a long road. It's about 200 kilometers uh, overall, I think. About, around there some, uh, about a week, if you walk, it's about a week's journey. And on this long road happens this miraculous event. He sees a light and he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asks, who are you, Lord? He actually says the word Lord. He knows is the presence of more than just mere humans. And he's got his answer. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus. In that very moment, all that Paul had in mind as being right became wrong. And all that Paul believed to be wrong became right. A total transformation of perspective. As a Jew, he hated Christians because of Jesus. Now Jesus is speaking to him and his whole mindset is reversed. And I can actually, I can edit, I can testify to, to a small degree actually, because I've never met Jesus like that. But I've seen, I've lived through a transformation like this. I finished high school in 88, 1988 that would be, not, I'm, not, I'm yeah, 1988, and I was drafted right off, and I went to the military service as a draftee. And I served in a, in a, in a um, security, in a, with communist police, uh, communist, communist military branch would be in, uh, in Romania, defending the, you know, our communist, uh, dear communist leaders. Served until 89, actually 1990, January, and I was uh, discharged in, 18, in January 20, January 1990, I was discharged, January 27th. And uh, I came home to a changed country. All that we called good when I was drafted, which was communism, our president, our system, whatever, all that was now called bad. And everything that was called rotten and perverse and bad, which was communism and, communism and democracy, was now seen as the thing to achieve. It took me about six months honestly, to actually process all that transformation, actually come to grips to this new reality of the world I lived in, and it's not easy. And that was just a change of regime. Paul had a change of who God is, and that was even more, even more dramatic. So I, it's, it's just amazing what Paul experienced here. You know, he walks from Jerusalem as a proud Pharisee, and on that road, he meets, he meets humility. He is humbled under God's strong hand, under God's mighty hand, so that he can be exalted in, times, in the time of the Lord. Just in 1 Peter 5, 6, he is now humbled under God's mighty hand, but one day we know he will be exalted. No pride left, he walks blindly into Damascus. Because that's what the Lord said. You know, it says in verse, um, actually, it says, we just read this. So I'm going to just go straight to the other one. It says here, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by hand, he, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. That's the end of our passage here. So what do we have here? You see it on the screen, you just heard it read. What do we have here? 
In simple terms, we have this. Christ, sorry, Saul has a radical encounter with the living Christ that changes him forever. And how is he changed with this radical or through this radical encounter? One, Christ takes hold of him. Christ just grabs him. Christ comes, and actually let me read this verse. Uh, is it on screen? No, it's not on screen. Sorry. Philippians 3.12. Make a note if you want or open up quickly if you have your speed with you. Philippians 3.12. Not that I have al already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may, so I may lay hold of, watch of that for which I also was laid hold by Jesus Christ. He said, I was laid hold. I was grabbed by Jesus Christ. He grabbed me. You know, this, this physical, it's not just, you know, uh, yes, Paul, let me bring you. It's not this. It's like going and, and grabbing something and bringing back in the kingdom with force. That's image here. And Paul knows he, Christ took hold of him. And of course, he's got this, not just the light that he sees and kind of blinds him. He has this inward illumination. Because he sees the light. He may be blind, but he sees the light. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, not on the screen again. So 2 Corinthians 4, 6, if you may take notes. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He knows the true light is not from the sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, S-U-N. It's but from the sun, S-O-N, from Jesus Christ. He was, he was laid hold by Jesus. He sees the light more than just one sense. And in the end, he sees God's mercy flowing over him. Imagine this. He understands he was opposing God. He understands he fought against God. And as a good Jew, as a Pharisee, as a man of the law, he knew what happens to those who fight against God. He knew he was in hot water, if I can say that. He knew he was in trouble. He knew he deserved death and punishment eternal. And that's why he says, it is only by God's mercy that is overflowing me. All I am is only by God's mercy. And this is on the screen because I just realized that. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. Paul writes in 1 Timothy, yet I was shown mercy because I acted igno ignorantly in, and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. The grace, in the words of Old English, was munificent, poured out beyond what was needed or deserved. God's grace was overflowing. The grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and the love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, or how Jesus would say it, amen, amen, deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came to this, the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all, or how King James would put it, I am the chieftain of them all, or something along those lines. Um, Dave would know more, but it's, he says he's a chieftain of all sinners. That's how Paul sees him, and this is what happened in his life. Christ took hold of him. He saw the light, but not just with his eyes, but with his heart and mind, and he realized how much of God's grace was flowing over him and how much of God's mercy he received. What happens next is this, a very important thing. Saul surrenders his will to the Lord. We'll go outside the bit of chapter 9 of, of, um, of Acts. We'll still stay in Acts. He asks this question, Acts 9, 5. Who are you, Lord? But in a, in a third writing about this encounter in Acts 26, Luke adds this question. Acts tw actually, so Acts, sorry, Acts, the second is Acts 22, verse 10. He asks Jesus, what shall I do, Lord? He's got two questions. 
Who are you? Lord, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. And then his next question is, what shall I do, Lord? What am I to do? What do you want me to do now? His will is surrendered to the Lord. He left for Damascus as a proud Pharisee, as a proud man with a strong will and determination. He enters Damascus a humble man, dependent on others to be carried in, you know, by hand, but most of all, dependent on this Jesus he just met for the first time. In some way, in some way it's a reminder of Joshua 5, of how the will surrenders to the Lord. Joshua was a great commander of God's army. Great promises from the Lord. Joshua 1, verse 7, 8, and 9. Fear not, for I am with you. Same promises as, he, as Moses received, Joshua receives, and he sees mighty works of God in the next few chapters. But as he approaches the city of Jericho, Jericho? Jericho, right? The walls is Jericho. Okay, the city of Jericho, which is chapter 6, that mighty, mighty victory of, of uh, Joshua against the people of Jericho, city of Jericho, that's chapter 6. Well, there's a chapter 5 right before, in which he leads the people into circumcision. He brings God's army into God's covenant, because only God's army that is in God's covenant can fight God's war. And then he's got the whole nation celebrate East, uh, Passover, because they must come before God on their knees as a nation and celebrate the faithfulness of God. But one more thing happens, last few verses of chapter 5 of, of Joshua. When Joshua goes out as a good general to inspect the field, the battle for tomorrow, and as he does that, a, a person, a man, walks towards him and he says, Joshua asks him, are you with me or with them? And the person, which we know now is an angel, responds, neither nor, for I am the Lord, I am the, the captain of the Lord's army. And Joshua falls down and says, what shall I do? What do you want me to do? He was a strong man, a man with conviction, a man of God, a man blessed by God, but still he got the best question ever. What shall I do, Lord? Tell me guide me. I am not in control. You are in control. Saul thought he was in control as a Pharisee, as a Jew. He thought he has the power, authority to do what he believed was right. He was in control. And as he, as he meets Jesus, he has to surrender his will to the Lord. But the story doesn't end here. And that's where we actually move to Acts 26. So if you want to read this story of, the, of Paul's conversion, it's got, you've got the three, uh, three, three chapters to look at. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. In each part, Paul adds one more, a bit more of, of his story, enlarges the image. And now, going to facts, Acts 26, it's on the screen actually, we have this, a commissioning for service. His hold, grabbed hold by Christ, he sees the light, he's overflown by God's mercy, but doesn't stop there. One more step, which is the commissioning for service. Oh, oh, it's kind of small font, so you may use your own Bibles. Acts 26, 15, starting. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you. So God had a purpose and says, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only the things which you have seen, also the things which, in which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified, sanctified by faith in me. God had a purpose to appoint him a minister and a witness, and he got a people to send him to Jews and Gentiles alike. Paul was commissioned by Jesus. He's, got, he's had his personal encounter, which was the beginning of a new life with God. He surrendered his will to the will of the Lord. What shall I do, Lord? And now this commissioning comes as the culmination of the transformation. Because God wants to use Saul, and he will use Saul mightily. 
And God wants to use you. God wants to transform you and to commission you for his service. You do not have to be an ordained pastor to be commissioned for service. I used to do this back in the church in Romania at Open Heaven. I would ask this question once in a blue moon. Who here is a full-time missionary? And we had a couple of hands because we have a bunch of, uh, of missionaries that would come to our church. So three, four, five would raise their hands, 10 maybe, I don't know. But I ask again, okay, who is a full-time missionary? Two, three hands more would stand up. And then I would ask again, I would keep asking until everybody had their hands up. Because it's not just me or Nick or others who are commissioned for full-time service to God. Every single Christian has this experience. A personal encounter with God when we meet Jesus. We have a surrendering of will and understand that not my will, but thine be done. And then we receive our own commissioning for service, for our own way of ministering to the people God sends us to specifically. But let's make this even more personal. And that's actually the last, last, last slide. God is in the business of changing hearts. Saul, soon to be known as Paul, had a rebel heart. And what happened here is best described in what is on the screen now. As Augustine of Hippo said this, the violent capture of rebels will. And his, and his experience is not unique. Although the specific, the extraordinary specifics of his ministry, of his um, conversion are, are, are just for him. I mean, the seeing of the light and being on Damascus Road and all those stuff, you know, that's for Paul or Saul. But others have had the same thing. They met Christ. They saw the light. They received commissioning for service. Zacchaeus, Matthew 19, Luke 19, it's 19 something. I think it's Matthew 19. You know, Zacchaeus sees the Lord. His heart has changed and he goes into a ministry of generosity. Levi, a customs officials, a thief by all definitions, meets Christ. He's called by Christ. He's commissioned by Christ, becomes Matthew that we know today. John and Jacob as disciples, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, called by Christ, changed by Christ, commissioned by Christ. Moses, same story. I don't have to go through all these. Abraham, same story. Joseph, same story, met by God, surrendered their wills to God, and then used by God. Let's say it again, met by God, surrendering their will to God, and then used by God. Richard Wurmbrand, I, don't, I think somebody, I think Mike or somebody was reading a book by his recently. Same thing, as a young kid, he was proud and full of what he thought was great things by, from himself. And God changed him and made him this hero, huge hero of faith in Romania and worldwide. I was honored to meet him a couple of times in person. And he was a small man of stature, but a huge man of God. And me, take me. Who have thought back 20 years ago, back 30 years, well, more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I would be today speaking here. Me, a young communist kid, holding my, my rubber, um, what you call this, rubber stick, rubber baton, and my shield and my white helmet, defending the communist party in Romania on December 1989. And here am I today, preaching the gospel. I had this encounter back in Romania when for a, for a, for a good season of time, we had this uh, gentleman named Catalin in my church. Actually, was one of my translators because I spoke in Iranian and he would translate English to our con congregation because we had a, a mixed uh, community there. And Catalin fled Romania in 89. He, he just jumped the border into, uh, and he ended up in Austria and he found a Christian there and he actually became a Christian. And God used him mightily, he used him mightily. And I was in 89, I was, on, I was the one pointing my gun towards Catalin. Not directly because I was not a border guard, but still, figuratively speaking, I was pointing my gun towards God. And now, you know, in 2008, we were working side by side in the church preaching the gospel. 
only by God's grace. Don't think that anything is or something is impossible. Don't look at your own heart and say, God can never use me. If you meet Christ in person, if you surrender your will to him, he will commission you. It may not look like Paul's ministry, it may not look like Adi's ministry, but it will be your ministry for God, for which, one, for which God will call you faithful, whether it's small or big. All these transformations that we spoke about share a common trait that we all should experience. The personal encounter with Christ, the surrender of him to him in penitence and faith or repentance and faith and a commissioning for or summoning for service. We may not experience the same dramatic events like Saul. We might not hear a voice, although some of us may hear voices that's separate, that's different. We might not see a light, but we'll still but still, the essentials that need to be there will be there. The encounter with God, the surrender of the will, and the call to fruitfulness for his kingdom. If you're here in person or on Zoom, and you do not know Jesus, have not yet met Jesus, I'm going to just I'm telling you this. God's grace is the same today. He's calling you to him. And he will continue to call you to tug at your heart, to bring in your life situations, circumstances that will bring you to the same place as Saul, uh, to say, who are you, Lord? And to surrender your will to him. You may say, I'm a good person. Let me tell you this again. Good is not enough. Good without God is nothing. You need peace with God. And that peace comes through Jesus Christ alone as you surrender your will to him. He wants and he's able to transform you and to use you. And don't wait until tomorrow. If that is you today, you can start today. If you don't know how, text me, call me, me or one of the elders. Get in touch with us and we will walk this path together. You don't have to walk alone. You shall never walk alone. And for if you know Christ, if you've known Christ for one year, 10 years, 50 years, or how much, I don't even know, for some of you. He wants to remind you today that he must be on the throne of your life. Not just part of your life, but to be the dominant voice in your life. A rebel will stands, always stands to hold the reins of our life. We want to control our lives. That's, in part, that's part of our human sinful nature. But God will goad us to, God will do this, I mean, do this to us on and on and on to remind us that we are not in control, but he is. Do not wait for the storms of life to turn to him. Don't waste your life thinking you might be in control. Give him complete control of your life. Surrender to him. Receive his commission and you shall you will never regret it. Let's pray together.